Welcome to today's Love and Work webcast. I'm Julie Duvall, Editor of Special Projects and Webinars at Harvard Business Review, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Marcus Buckingham. Marcus is a New York Times bestselling author and world-renowned researcher on strengths, human performance, and leadership. The reason we're all here today is that we are kicking off a six-part learning series based on the insights of Marcus's forthcoming book, Love and Work. But this is so much more than a book, and you will learn why in today's session. Most of the workforce today is unhappy in their jobs. We're stressed out, we're burned out, and just simply going through the motions. And that's really not how it should be. We deserve a job that we love, a career where our strengths are put to use every day, a task that we can sink our teeth into and know that the organization is better off as a result of our great work. Today, Marcus is going to show us how we got here, how we can start to turn it around, and more importantly, why love is the key factor for making us happier and more productive at work. So before I turn this over to Marcus, I wanted to let everyone know that this event is being recorded and will be emailed to all attendees following the event. It will also be posted on loveandwork.org. Marcus, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so glad to be with you. And while I'm disappointed we weren't able to do this in person, I know we'll be able to do that in a future webinar session. So we'll look forward to that. Yeah, how are you, Julie? Can, uh, can you see and hear me all good? I can, yes. And so glad to be with you. And kick us off, Marcus, how did we get here? Well, here was supposed to be HBS and of course then the Omicron did its wonderful thing, and I think an abundance of caution. So we will, you and I, we'll be sitting together here shortly. Um, we just, for all of you watching, we just thought it might be a little bit toned up. We were in the same room with no masks and no one really sure exactly what was coming around the corner, as has been the case, I suppose, for the last uh, two, two years. But what we're talking about here, Julie, is the, the simple fact that for many millions of us, work just isn't working. We have engagement levels, and this was pre-pandemic, Engagement levels at 16, 17%. We've done this through my role as head of people and performance research at the ADP Research Institute. We, we've done global research on resilience and resilience around the world is about 16, 17%. This is pre-pandemic. Pre and then now during the pandemic, of course, we've just sort of turned the pressure on. We knew we had a problem with burnout in doctors and nurses before the pandemic. We were having all sorts of challenges. Only sort of 73, 74% of doctors would advocate to their children not to be doctors. I mean, we, we had a problem beforehand. Now, of course, we're seeing resilience two or three percentage points lower, engagement two or three percentage points lower, basic trust in colleagues and team leaders, team and se senior leaders um, down in the, in the low mid teens. We've got something going on, regardless of the pandemic, something that alienates many millions of workers, at least according to the workers that are the workers. When you actually just measure their sentiment, work is not a place in which you go to discover yourself. Work is not a place in which you go to nourish yourself. Work actually is a thing that you withstand. Work is something that you have to keep at bay. Work is something, in the cliche term, of course, Julie, that you have to balance out with life. In fact, today, I don't know whether you saw this, but I just saw Panasonic, um, the global uh, you know, uh, tech company is, is officially going to a four day, a four day work week, uh, presumably because if work is really bad, then we shouldn't have too much of it. And therefore five days is worse than four days, which I guess would be worse than three days. So we've got some systemic challenge around the relationship of it, us as individuals to the work that we're being paid to do. And you can see it in all sorts of data. So in a sense, pandemic or no pandemic, pre-term pandemic, during pandemic, post-pandemic, we've got a challenge in terms of having workplaces which really see the whole human being. So I know we're gonna get into this a little bit later on, um, but it's not just us that are stressed out, it's kids that are stressed out. It's, um, they're obviously facing something wrong in their lives. Talk a little bit about that for us. Well, again, you know, when I mean, the pandemic, of course, is just causing uh, uh, challenges in terms of how we educate and parents that are stressed. But what we know for sure, and this is global, we know that, that we are creating through the way in which we do school, 
we're creating super stressed out, alienated kids. We're prescribing Adderall at record levels. We're prescribing the Xanax to reduce the stress of the Adderall. We are from almost from kindergarten. I mean, obviously zero to five, you take a kid zero to five, every parent, for those of you that are parents, you, you know this, you look at your kids zero to five and it's like, they are just a ball of uniqueness and amazing, wonderful weirdness. And you look at them and you see their whole humanness and you, and you kind of just invest them with love. And you know in your heart that your hope is that they will be the greatest and biggest version of themselves. And, and they're just sort of wrapped in a bubble of love. And then you send them to school and almost immediately, love is drained out of their lives from five. And I don't want to be cynical about this, but let's just be honest about it. From five all the way through to the end of college, education really is information transfer and confirmation. It's information transfer, as in there's nothing inside the kid. We got to teach the kid a whole bunch of facts or skills, and then we test the kid to confirm whether or not that stuff has filled up their vessel. And the best student is the one that's fullest. And so all the way through high school and into college, education is really just meeting requirements. In high school, it's often GPA requirements, but you go to college and then there's a list of required classes in order for you to graduate in four years and you have to meet those requirements. And then goodness knows, we, we have you graduate and then you join the working world, as you know, at, at HBR, you hire a bunch of graduates. And then we define work as meeting requirements, goal requirements, competency requirements. So almost from five, all the way up to when you join the working world and beyond, who you are as an individual, who you uniquely are, and all the stuff that your parents looked at you with and hoped that you could become this biggest version of yourself, all of that almost becomes irrelevant. And your success as a student, as a college graduate, as a worker becomes how closely do you meet the requirements that we've set up for you? Your uniqueness isn't just not interesting to us. It's kind of an impediment to you meeting the requirements of the model. That's the big ecosystem that we're facing. And then we wonder why people are so alienated at school or we wonder why people are so lost at work. Why do we need to drug ourselves up so much at school and at work? It, well, we sort of built it so that you get, so you get hidden. It's sort of built that way. Right. So you did just mention work. So I want to bring it back to work because, yeah. you know, a pandemic aside, we are kind of in this economy that's booming. Organizations are doing well. You know, even universities are doing well. Endowments are up. So where's the problem? Well, the, the problem right now for individuals is pretty clear. We don't feel nourished at school. We don't feel nourished at work. We feel that surveilled at work. We feel mistrusted at work. Um, we feel a blurring of the lines, of course, between work and home and the pandemic's just sort of turned it up to 11. Um, so for us as individuals, something about work isn't psychologically working for us. For companies, here's the problem for companies, is that we have one of the tightest labor markets. And this is true in many, many, not all, not all, but many, many countries around the world you have some of the tightest labor markets that you've seen in 50 years. Here in the US, we have 4.5 million job openings. There's plenty of people to fill the job. <laughs> they just don't want to go. So we, we, you know, we, we called it the great resignation, but it's really sort of the great reassessment. And for the individual, the reassessment, Julie, at least from the data, at least from the data, the, the, the reassessment for the individual is what is work doing for me psychologically? as well as financially, but for the companies, for the companies, it's how and why do I deserve the best people? I mean, I was talking to the CEO of a healthcare system the other day, 13,000 people in the company, 700 nurse openings. You look at um, the health, the um, uh, childcare, in, in, uh, you've got 10% reduction in the number of people performing childcare functions, kindergarten functions. Um, and no one willing to step in to fill the gap. So parents are sort of a, a loss because we've lost all of those people who heretofore were providing childcare. Um, every industry, uh, truck drivers, now you, you used to be $20 an hour, now they're up in $25 an hour just to get people back into the trucks. So sort of everywhere you look, companies, even though they are doing pretty well, well, notwithstanding the last week with the stock market, but they have a talent problem. 
a huge talent problem. And, and it's not just a supply and demand problem. It's a psychology problem of the individuals who they want to recruit. Why, as a, so as a company, you've got to answer the question, why do we deserve really good people? Why? And at the moment, that's a challenge for many companies, but I think it's not overly Pollyanna to say, it's actually an opportunity for many great companies to come out of the situation completely recalibrating what the promise is. What does work promise you? If it promises you surveillance software and meeting of requirements and conformity and uniformity, then you won't deserve the best people, which I guess is why we're having this conversation. Right, right. And you're, you're making me think of another question that a lot of organizations are struggling with that might not be the question they should be asking, but it's um, how many days back into the office or should we be hybrid? Should we be fully virtual, fully all in? It's almost like it kind of doesn't matter, um, you know, as long as what you're saying, we're creating the jobs where people want to do and, and people want to go to. Yeah. I mean, we if you look around, an awful, and of course you're in this business because you you put out the magazine, you've got all the podcasts that you have, and you see all the all the stuff that people are writing about in terms of the world of work. And as you know, a lot of the conversation is about, well, how many days should it be back in the office, or how many days should there be in a working week? And there's all sorts of conversation about that. And it does seem as though that's missing the point. The point is wherever you do work. By the way, the data show it is entirely possible for you as a team leader, if any of you are team leaders, if a person is working remotely or if a person is working right next to you, you can build connection with them or not build connection with them. The, the physical location doesn't seem to drive team connection or not. Team connection is a function of what happens in your heart or what happens in your mind, not what particular office you happen to be in. So there's a way to stay connected so long as we think about work differently. At the moment, we think almost uniformly of work in the same way we think of school. We define the requirements. Who you are as a unique individual is irrelevant. And then we measure you against those requirements. We hold you accountable for those requirements. And I'm not suggesting that we have chaos, but we, we can get into that if you want. But we haven't really stopped and thought about why do we keep designing such loveless work? If we design loveless work, Let's take housekeepers in hotels. If we assume that housekeeping is a rotten job that no one would wanna do, then lo and behold, it shouldn't be that surprising that we end up designing rotten work that no one wants to do. Same with warehouse jobs, same with professional services jobs, same with sales jobs. If we assume that people are gonna to try to get away with working as little as they can, if people basically don't have great intentions, but also if we assume that each person is basically an empty vessel and we can, their uniqueness of what they love, what they loathe, what they, is all changeable. We could, we could rewire your brain into whatever we want you to be. If that's what we assume, then no wonder we design jobs that are basically loveless. And yet, sorry to be all animated about this, but and yet, if you look at excellence at work, in housekeeping, I, my, my first job at Gallup was interviewing the world's best housekeepers at Walt Disney World. Boy, you, and I know that sounds like sort of a silly sentence, world's best housekeepers sound like, like what? But, I was talking to the eight best housekeepers at once, and, and they are amazing. And they talk about all the sort of fun stuff that they do in a guest room to make the guests feel at home. They lie on the bed, they turn on the ceiling fan because that's what the guest does if they come back after a long day in the theme parks. They arrange the little toys of the kids in a little scene every day. And you just go, wow, that job sounds so great. If you, if you look at excellence at work, also outside of work and sport. And for, but when you look at excellence at work, there's always love in it. Loveless excellence is an oxymoron, isn't it? There's no collaboration without love. There's no real trust without love. There's no real um, innovation without love. So it, when companies really look at what they want, innovation, collaboration, creativity, you don't get any of that if you've designed loveless work. And we've designed, and we could get into details of this, but a lot of the work that we've designed, housekeepers is one sort of classic example, we've designed work as though there's no love in it, and then there's no love in it. And then lo and behold, people only want to work for it. Like it's, it's sort of a, you know, it's a downward spiral of bad assumptions. Right, well, you're actually getting to a question that a couple people have. Um, Anthony and Ahmad both, 
are thinking about the love element. And I know we were going to transition to this anyways. So give us a good definition of love and what we're talking about in regards to whether it's the book or, you know, all that you've been talking about. Yeah. So when I'm talking about love initially, I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm not initially talking about love of another human. I'm talking about the fact that every single one of us as human beings, and you're never taught this, no one ever teaches you this at school. I was helping my daughter uh, figure out what the difference was between a parallelogram and a rhombus the other day, because there was homework. And you realize there's 10 years of really detailed curriculum on geometry. I mean, somebody's really thought about 10 years of curriculum on geometry, and then put my daughter and every other kid through that curriculum. She has nothing on herself. There is no time. There's no hours spent on who my daughter is, what drives her, what she loves, what she loathes, what's the detail of that, what's the specifics of that, how do you use the stuff you encounter in your day to figure out what you love or loathe. It's all so generic, isn't it? It's like the Steve Jobs thing, do what you love, and then we sort of leave it at that. But actually, actually, what we know for sure is that every single human, regardless of their gender, regardless of their race, regardless of their siblings and what socioeconomic environment they grew up in, every single one of you watching today is, is unbelievably unique in terms of the synaptic connection network in your brain. If we actually count the number of synaptic connections in your brain, you have more synaptic connections in your brain than there are stars in 5,000 Milky Ways. That's not a hyperbole. That, that's, it's probably an undercounting, actually, of the amount of synaptic connections in your brain. So what that means is you are unimaginably unique in terms of what you laugh at, what you pay attention to, what gives you a kick, where you get bored, where you get uplifted. Like, just imagine how much uniqueness is in you. And if you've got a sibling or a brother and a sister, you'll sort of see that immediately, don't you? That you grew up in the same household, maybe you've got the same parents, and yet you're so different from your brother and your sister. What's amazing, and what I hope this, as much as anything else, Julie, what I hope that this whole movement starts, other than how do we change jobs and how do we change our relationship with our team members and our team leader, which we should. But I hope one of the things that we do is it gets you to change your relationship to your life. Normally, we think of life as like the enemy to keep back, don't we? I don't know about you, but I know that I wake up, I woke up this morning with things that I didn't do yesterday. <laughs> You know, you, you wake up with a list, don't you? And your life is sort of something to, to keep back and to keep at bay. And, and yeah, actually, if we think about life differently, life every single day is sending you signals all the time about what you might love. Little moments, contexts, uh, activities, situations, people. It's sending you thousands of signals every day. It's like putting on a show for you every day. It's like speaking to you in a language that only you understand. And so part of this whole love and work approach is it begins actually by saying to you, you have a massively unique network of synapses in your brain. And it means that you speak a weird language that only you speak and life tells you. It sends you clues every day about that which you love activity, situation, context, people, that which you love. What we know from Mayo Clinic research is that the most resilient doctors and nurses don't spend 100% of their time doing something that they love, but they've figured out through the signals that life is sending enough of what they love to do at least 20% of activities in their day that they love, 20%. 20% appears to be a threshold, by the way, Julie. Like above that, you don't seem to get much more bang, but below that, 18, 17, 16, 10%. With each percentage point reduction in time you spend on activities that you love, there is an increase in burnout risk. So we don't need to, um, we don't need to do what we love. We need to find the love in what we do, which is really different. No one's ever taught you how to do it, which is absurd, but also true. You have you know, we said there's five love languages. No, there's as many love languages as there are people alive on the world. And if we can teach you to begin with, not you, Julie, but you, everybody's watching, 
how to use the signals that life sends you every bloody day to help you add more detail and more specificity to that which you love. And that's, that's really where it begins. Psychology doesn't teach you this. Social psychology doesn't teach you this. We're too busy categorizing you. We put you in categories. You're an extrovert, you're an introvert. You're, and, and we like categories, but you're a category. When we actually look at what's in your brain, you're a category of one. And we've got to help you get really expert about the one that is you. And boy, what a great place to start at work because it's such a rich environment. Right. As I'm listening to you talk and you said Myers-Briggs, I'm thinking, oh, I hope a lot of managers out there are thinking, I'll just have, you know, my teammates do the Myers-Briggs and then I'll understand what their strengths are and then we'll be on our way. But that's not the fix here. So tell us a little bit more about what the fix will look like inside organizations. Well, uh, by the way, no knock on Myers-Briggs. No, no knock. Right. No knock on Anything which starts you thinking about the fact that somebody on your team might be wired a little bit differently than you, heck, I built Standout I, with Don Clifton, created Strength Finder. I mean, getting people to start thinking a little bit about the fact that you don't treat people as you would like to be treated, because that presupposes that they're wired exactly the same way that you are. You treat people as they would like to be treated. So anything like Myers-Briggs or DISC or Strength Finder or Standout, those are good, different angles, but those are good ways to help a team leader go, oh, you might be wired a little bit differently than me. But, but as with Standout, if you take the Standout assessment, you get your top two strengths roles of nine, but really that's not the end of the conversation. That's the beginning. It's like, I always think of the top two standout roles as like coordinates. My top two happen to be um, stimulator creator. So I always think with standout, it's like, meet me on the corner of stimulator creator and I'll get out of the car and poke around on that coordinate to get more detail, more vividness, more specificity about the actual activities that I love. And there are some clues. I mean, there's the most obvious clue. What do you instinctively volunteer for? Where do you instinctively raise your hand? So, sometimes that leads you astray. It's like a misinstinct. But, but those things you instinctively find yourself doing this for, that is an interesting thing to pay attention to. Um, flow. When, are you, when, when you're doing something in just time, so it seems to just whip by. Mike Chekshamahai, the eminent positive psychologist who we just lost this last year, um, he coined that, that term, flow, when the steps just fall away. So those things that you're doing where it feels like you've been doing it for five minutes, but you look up, it's been an hour. That's really interesting. We don't help you know that at 10, which is such a shame because you could spend your entire teenage years just adding more detail and vividness to, wow, how do I learn? And, and, and why does that turn, that book, it felt like I was reading it for five minutes, but I was reading it for an hour. Well, some other books, I read it for an hour, it feels like, you know, it's the opposite. So flow is a lovely thing to pay attention to. Um, it, it just clicks. That's another clue where you learn it faster than you should. I bet you've had that, right? Mm -hmm. we, you and mm -hmm. I have actually talked, we've about, talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. That there's some things you learn where you actually have to learn the steps because it's like, you know, molasses. But there are other things where it's almost like you've done it before in a previous life or something and you... It just clicks. Okay, that's interesting. And more broadly, Julie, just this one. How about this clue? What do you find yourself instinctively paying attention to? When you instinctively pay attention to something that other people don't, has anyone ever just drilled down with you on that? And then is that part of a pattern? How about that? Is there a pattern of attention that you have where you're instinctively picking up on things that other people aren't picking up on? Okay, what a wonderful avenue of inquiry to go down. And yeah, Myers-Briggs, that might be a good place to start. Strength Finder, stand out, good places to start. If you're a team leader and you don't get to see your people who are brand new on the team, fine, give them stand out or give them strength. But that's, that's fine. It accelerates your understanding of uniqueness. That's fine. But don't, don't stop there because it, you're, you're taking 5,000 Milky Ways and you're massively oversimplifying who you are. Okay, don't, don't do that. You're such a unique creature. All we know from the data is the most resilient, most successful people 
really take the detail and the specificity of what they love really seriously. And then they turn it into contribution. So the best doctors do, nurses do, salespeople, leaders, they're taking their loves seriously, even if their school and their workplace and their team leader might not be. So there are a lot of audience questions coming in. So I definitely want to start getting to some of those. But before we um, take these questions, Marcus, you and I have been talking about um, some ways that we want to bring this to life um, for everybody in the audience. And you have a couple of ideas for what's coming down the pike after today um, in regards to love and work. Yeah, so actually, if we could um, if we could share that slide of what's of what's coming down the pike, that would be uh, that would be great. But um, I know, as I was describing this, um, hopefully you can all you can all see that. Um, look, I, I'm describing an ecosystem here. We are massively overprescribing the Adderalls, the Xanax to our students. We've got anxiety at record levels, engagement at record low levels at work. We know there's a there's a systemic problem, and that can be a little overwhelming. So what, what myself and HBR thought would be helpful, in advance of a book in April, which is you know, months away, let's build, a, let's build a comprehensive learning series for you so that we can equip you to make change. Now, you might just want to make change in your own life. So how can you use the raw material of your own life to figure out how your life and work can nourish you rather than deplete you. So it might just be change in your own life, but you might be one of those people who wants to make change on your team, or maybe you're a parent and you wanna make change in the life of your student or the life of the school that the students are in. Uh, You might be in a relationship. If you're in a relationship with someone, what does the data share with us? What does the data tell us about how you see somebody with love? I know that sounds squishy, but, but there's a lot of really interesting data about how you see someone with love because so often in relationships it's like i love you you're perfect now change so we put this five part uh learning series together with hbr and julie and i are going to do this uh once a month uh, for the next four or five months and for those of you that pre-order the book we're going to make this comprehensive learning series available because we're basically trying to equip you a book isn't enough it's like we need to equip you with the tools the insight, the actions that you can take in whatever sphere of influence you think is most important to you. We can't fix work if we don't fix schools. Some of you might be more interested in work than schools. All right, then we're gonna try to help wherever you think you can make change. We're gonna try to equip you with the tools that you need. So if you you pre-order the book, you can come to these sessions and at the end of them, we're gonna give you the the designation of a love and work leader. I don't know where you lead. You might just lead yourself, as I said. You might lead really broadly in the world of work. You might lead really broadly in the world of education. But we, look, there's a limit to what you can do, Julie, and there's a limit to what I can do. We're gonna do that article in HBR. That's useful because HBR has got a good million subscribers. All right, that's good. We're gonna do a book. Okay, that's good. But there needs to be so much more I mean, in the federal government right now, if you don't meet certain requirements, regardless of your uniqueness, you can't get promoted to the next level. And there's you know, 3 million or so people who work for the federal government. So we might actually have to get to change some laws. The way we do schools is just not interested in the uniqueness of your child. I'm sorry, that's just true. Some of you are gonna make change there. So our hope with this series was that through HBR and myself and the team, we could give you access to tools that would equip you to make change. So if you pre-order the book, we'll, we'll start with, with you. That's why it says love and work and the leader with you on January the, January the 27th. Great, awesome. All right, let's, we've got a ton of interest here, Marcus, which is amazing to see. And also, I'd just like to say that what better time of year to be thinking about these things as we head into 2022. And I wanna start with this question, which is, okay, I've identified what it is during my day that I love to do, where, as you said, I've, time has passed so quickly and I feel like I'm making an impact, but it's not exactly what my boss is expecting me to do. How do I start having those conversations with my manager? Well, actually, before I would go there, um, the first way to use this love and work idea in your own life is to be intentional every morning. I think of those, if you think of your life sending you thousands of activities every day, it's like thousands of threads. 
in the fabric of your day. Some of them are brown, some of them are black, some of them are white, some of them are gray, a little up, a little down, but sort of basically emotionally sort of neutral. But some of those activities are red, in, in a sense, if you go with the metaphor. They're like activities that lift you up or that you instinctively volunteer for, that make you feel good. Or they're red threads. The Mayo Clinic research simply suggests that you don't need a red quilt, you just need about about 20% of your quilt every day be red threads. So the first thing to do every day, and you haven't done this, very few people do this, but every day you think about what red threads will I weave today? Your enemy isn't that your life doesn't have any red threads, your enemy's distraction, that no one's told you that those threads are there, or you've just lost track of your own red threads. So the first thing to do for yourself is think about what can I, what red threads can I weave today? today. And it doesn't mean that you have to have 100%. It's not like we have any data that shows that, that if you have a super intense love filled day, you're way more productive and resilient. No, what we found is that intensity isn't as important as frequency. Every day, what are you going to weave in terms of your red threads? So that's the first thing that I'd advocate. The second is when you're talking to your manager, you're not be careful with the language that you're using. You're not using language which says, I'm the best at this. I'm amazing at this. You're using language that says, hey, listen, I, I get a super kick out of doing this work. I find I'm at my best when I'm doing this work. Subtext, do you want me at my best? I find I come up with a ton of new ideas when I'm doing this work. Now, the manager might go, well, look, right now you can't do that. And you're going to go, OK, but first of all, I've shared it. So now you're aware that I'm aware that you're aware that I'm aware, and that's good. And then second, we can start to put together, just little by little, ideas with my manager about how that thing that I love turns into contribution. Because this whole thing about find love in what you do, it's not about individualism. It's not about self-involvement. It's about contribution. So that's what you would say to your manager. It's like, hey, if you want me to give more, and I don't just mean more in terms of quantity, but better ideas, more collaboration, more insight, as well as more resilience. Uh, you probably wanna know, I'm at my best when this, you can really turn to me for this. So if you're using language like that, you're framing your loves in terms of contribution. Now there's more, and we could talk more about what else you could do beyond that, because like what happens with the other work that you're doing and how do you, which gets us into another set of things to discuss. But well, that's where you would start, I think. Love is the precursor to contribution. And what team leader doesn't want more contribution? Right. So that um, brings up a follow-up question or more of a comment from Holly, which is this impacts um, hiring managers and trying to fit the right people for the right role. Does this change that, how it's been done in the past? Well, the, the first thing for Holly, for, you know, there's been some thought around like this leads to uh, chaos, right? Wow, all these people with all these 5,000 Milky Ways in everyone's brain, oh my word. Like uh, the reason we have requirements, Marcus, is because otherwise we can't get people to be aligned and we can't get people to serve customers or we can't get people to make products. I'm sure Adi, who's Julie's boss, who's the editor in chief of HBR, Adi wants to serve subscribers. I mean, he's like, Julie, <laughs> you're fine and everything, but <laughs> I've got all these subscribers I'm trying to serve. Well, humans have created this really innovative technology that enables an Adi to maximize your uniqueness. It's called a team. I know, I know we, we talk a lot about teamwork, but most organizations actually are not built around teams, weirdly, um, but they should be because that is even 40, 50,000 years ago, humans figured out that we can take down game animals that are way bigger than us if we combine the unique loves, passions, interests of the different people hanging out in our cave. And we know that from cave drawings, from way back when, 40, 50,000 years ago, we, we, we figured out the power that, that four fingers turn into a fist if you can figure out how to pull it together right. So of course, teams make perfect homes for your uniquely weird uh, loves. So that's the first thing that Adi would say, or that you would say to Adi, right? What team am I on? Because I'm, I'm not doing this all by myself. I've got different people on this team and presumably we're wired a bit differently. So that's the first thing, teams enable loves. And when we miss that, we miss where work happens and we miss where humans are nourished in terms of their work and in terms of how they rely on one another. 
But in terms of Holly, you, the next part of your question, absolutely. The hiring question, look, you go onto LinkedIn or any recruiting platform and you see jobs defined by process requirements, must have this set of competencies, attributes, experiences. What we should be doing is changing that to outcomes. We select for outcomes and then the hiring manager is thinking with Julie, or if, it, if you were the hiring manager for me, you'd be going, well, what are the outcomes I wanna pay Marcus to do? And then the question is, have I seen any of, the, A, can he articulate what he loves to do? Can he articulate it beyond, I love working with people? It's like, no, what are you doing with the people? <laughs> you know, Give me some detail, are you selling to them? Are you, cha are you challenging them? Are you uh, uplifting them? Are you analyzing? Like, what are you, give me a verb, you know? So your question as a hiring manager would be, what are Marcus's loves and do they enable him to find some way in combination with the team to get the outcomes we want? That's really what a hiring manager should be thinking. What are this person's loves and how do they turn into contribution on this team? Again, this is why we need everybody sort of needs the same understanding of this because we know this is an ecosystem and most of the big recruiting platforms just don't think about people in that way at all. We define requirements and then we measure people against the requirements. It's like you lose the people. Yeah, it makes me think about um, culture as a term that's thrown around a lot um, in business. And Allison actually has a question. Um, how important is company culture in thinking about work um, in the love and work sort of sphere, um, especially as we're discussing in-person versus hybrid, remote? How do we think about culture? Well, th that's a, a super interesting question because actually when you look at companies, Look, um, HBR writes about this all the time, but the truth is when you look at the data, people's lived experience at work varies massively according to which team they're on. Regardless of what a company might say on its website about its culture, its actual lived experience for people is a function of the particular people whose team they're on, even remotely. Which meetings are you on, which, which you know, whether it's WebEx teams or Microsoft teams or Zoom or whatever, you know, it's like, you're seeing your team and your team brings the work and that's real and it's gritty and it's not theoretical like culture. It's like, this is my team. So, and that varies. Even if you join a company like, I don't know, Tesla and you go, well, Tesla has a culture that's really different from uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, it, well, may, may, maybe the CEO of Tesla is different than Goldman Sachs, but the experience of working at Tesla will vary hugely according to which team you're on at Tesla. So that's the first thing one would say about culture. But the second thing really today, culture in a sense means talent brand. That's really what it is. So if a company stands up strongly and says, we believe in the value of the whole human, then that's a very strong statement culturally. Now it's a statement. So the way in which it actually gets played out will happen team by team by team by team by team by team. But for a CEO to go, you know what? The growth and the development of each human being is the moral starting point for everything we do. That's different than shareholder capitalism. That's different from even Joseph Stiglitz's stakeholder capitalism, which held that capitalism works best when you pay attention to shareholders, customers, and employees as sort of a tripartite set of stakeholders. This says, no, 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 no. The employee, her or his growth and development and expression is the primary integrating stakeholder. If we get that right as a company, if we make environments in which people's growth and learning and contribution is the integrating point for everything else, then of course customers will be better served. Of course our shareholders will be happier. But that cultural commitment is an incredibly important thing to hear from your CEO. And frankly, all the way through this pandemic, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for some companies to juxtapose themselves against other companies that I won't name, whose CEOs clearly are culturally saying, hey, employee, you're just a cog in the machine, man. And you need to follow these rules and regulations and I will check. And there's a whole bunch of, Big companies that basically are saying, your growth and development, your the, uh, trust that I have in you, the choices that I let you have, yeah, we're gonna limit those as much as we can. Deep down, I'm not, this company isn't really about 
your growth and contribution and development. Whereas there's other companies that have led with you're a whole human. And I want to trust you to use choice to develop yourself as a human, the way that any parent would. So culturally, if you've got a CEO that can stand for that, ooh, that's going to help you stand out in terms of your talent brand. No question. So what you're talking about um, gets to a question or more of a comment that Jennifer has. Uh, she was once told that despite her passion and the love for her work, work would never love her back. Do you have a response to that? Because it sounds like you can have a work that does love you back. Um, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, there's actually quite a lot of stuff written and out there on social media at the moment. And indeed, there's a, a study out of Iceland, which some of you may have seen about frequency of uh, work days on during a, during, during a week. But there's also a bigger movement that basically says, hey, listen, work is work. You go there, you do your work, you come back, and then you find your love elsewhere. Don't expect work to be a source of nourishment for you. It's not, it's a thing to withstand. A bit like school, don't expect school to have any interest in you at all. It's something to withstand. Strange language, weird rituals, strange measurement systems. Just suck it up. You, you could take that approach personally, and this is a belief, this is, I don't have data to support this, but I believe that is a very cynical and destructive approach. Um, what I'm talking about here is the fact that life, your life, is set up to, to give you many, many, many specific activities that lift you up, that make you feel like you, that make you feel super connected to you, not all activities. And you can't necessarily learn to love the ones that I have or you have, you know, vice versa, Julie, like you're you and I'm me. And, and, and it, it's not easy to categorize that. Like my, um, Michelle's kids, he, she has two, two boys. One of them, when he cooks and he loves to cook, um, it's like the fridge exploded. It's like the whole kitchen is just, <laughs> boom. So he's the disorganized one. No, you go up to his wardrobe and it's, everything's perfectly laid out. And the other kid, he comes in and, you know, he can't purell his hands enough in the kitchen. And he, he opens a small bag of chips and then runs immediately to the sink to wash his hands. So he's the organized one. Uh, no, go up into his room. And it's like the towel fairy came in and threw up all over the room. So people are really difficult to categorize. I know we, we like to do that, but, but the specificity of what you love is really uh, specific. Well, all that means about work is that work is an activity rich environment. It is throwing stuff at you all the time in the form of tasks and teammates and all the interaction between those two things. And there are some of those things that you will hate but there are some of those things that you will love. It's just that no one's told you how to sift through all that to pay attention to that which you love and turn it into contribution. So in that sense, work is part of life and life will love you back. Work will love you back. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't have any hobbies or you shouldn't find love in your charity work or your faith or your relationship. I mean, life's giving you lots of sources of activities, moments, context that you love. But one of them, and boy, it dominates our time, one of them is work. So the whole thing here is just saying, hey, listen, if you are really intentional about that which you love, and we can create a context for team leaders and organizations to build like a love and work organization, that's one that says, and I keep going back to my first experience with housekeepers at Walt Disney World, like people assumed that that job is a rotten job and that you would want to get promoted out of that as fast as you could. But you talk to some of the people that were amazing at it, and it's filled with love. Now, weirdly, this is 10 years ago or so, but you know, Walt Disney World had created requirements that said you can't lie on the bed, which is what some of the best housekeepers did, because that's how the guest sees the room, and that was some of the kick they got out of the job. And there were requirements saying you can't touch any more of the guest possessions to clean the room, and yet that was precisely what some of the best ones were doing. So there's an irony there. That if, if we don't pay attention to the fact that work can love you back, we end up defining requirements that are completely blind to what the best people love about what they do. So work doesn't always love you back, but it can offer you such raw material 
about that which you love. And of course, if you do that really intentionally, you excel in a way that doesn't burn you up. I'm not, that's not simplistic. I know that's a challenge. You and I've talked about that, but anyway. Well, so because um, I work for HBR and a lot of our subscribers always have this question and Gary, who is joining us today also has this question. How do you measure this? Is it, you know, profits are up and our shareholders are happy or something else? Well, you know, I'm a psychometrician by training and by, and that basically means um, I'm someone who's dedicated my career to trying to measure things about a person that are really important, but that you can't count. So you can count lost work days, you can count accidents on the job. My focus has always been sentiment. Can you measure strengths? Can you measure engagement? Can you measure resilience? Even can you measure inclusion? Um, so in terms of that question, some of the things that we would see would be countable. Absences, lost work days, accidents on the job, theft. I mean, if you wanted to see some countable things that show that people are alienated from their job, those would be some of the things that you would look at. Right now, many organizations are experiencing very significant amounts of absence. Some of it sort of COVID related, some of it ticked offness related. If you've got 4.5 million job openings and plenty of people to fill them and they're not filling them, then that's a countable thing that something's wrong. The second thing you'd look at is reliable measures of engagement, frankly. The two most powerful questions of all the engagement questions we've ever asked over the 25 years, the two questions that are most likely around the world, and this is global, this isn't just North America or whatever, that predict productivity, customer satisfaction, lost work days, et cetera, et cetera, are, do I have a chance to use my strengths every day? And was I excited to go to work every day last week? Not all day, every day, but those two questions, if you wanted to measure, by the way, the number right now globally is about 17%. 17% of people strongly agree with those two items. If we were to have success with this whole bloody movement, excuse the bloody, um, you'd see that number move. You'd see that number move, 17%. Anyone on this call right now is probably thinking to themselves, I want a job in which I get a chance to use my strengths every day, and I want a job where I'm excited to go to work every day. That's not not doable. It's doable. It's just that we're not actually set up to do it. So to, to that question, that's what I would look at from a, from a sentiment standpoint. And then there are other things that I mentioned that I would look at from a countable standpoint. One of the things I do just to um, keep going with what you said I love about the book is when you say, you know, uh, if you're sitting there and you're doing one part of your job that you love, it, you're right, it's not every day, all day long, even just knowing, you know, what those moments are throughout your day. Um, you know, I have a head start, I've read the book. So um, that's just that helps carry me on times where I'm working in spreadsheets and have to deliver numbers to my manager, and I don't want to do that. However, I know that I can go back and do what I, I do love that gets me through the day. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? You, I happen to know you love doing this. Now you weren't hired to do this. Nope. When you first started in your job, right? How much of your job when you were first hired for an eminent, eminent magazine and, and company like Harvard Business Publishing, did you do any of this? I did not, no, I didn't. So just to, just to help people know how real worldy this is, how, why are you doing this? How did you get to do this? What yeah. You, do? you want me to tell you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I identified, um, you know, I had a mentor who was doing this and I identified, wow, that's really interesting. Um, and I, you know, followed her and watched a lot of um, webinars. And I went to my boss and said, I'd like to start doing some of these just to test, get my foot in the water, get my foot in the door. And he al allowed me to do that, of course, with the caveat, you know, make sure you're getting your other work done. We have lots and lots of content for you to be promoting out there. Um, and here I am. I loved it. And I started doing more of them. Um, and yeah, it's a, now it's grown to about 40% of my job. You see that from our data, we know 73%, and this is North America. So I apologize if you're listening from somewhere else in the world and I don't have the data for your country, but 73% of people in North America say that I have the freedom to modify my job to fit myself better. 73%. 
but only 17% of people say I'm excited to go to work every day. So in psychology, we call that an attitude behavior consistency problem. We know we've got the freedom to maneuver. We just don't maneuver. Probably because we spent more time teaching people about parallelograms in the course of their college years or their high school years than we have about, like what you did is, you figured out something that you got a kick out of. Just the thing, it didn't, didn't live in your job description, but you honored it with your attention which is the first thing, because it's just it just lifts you up. It's fuel. It's the weirdest thing, but it's fuel. It doesn't wear you out. It like lifts you up. And then you bothered to go to someone and say, hey, listen, can I try that? You're like you just wove away a red thread. Maybe one week you just tried it. And then you tried it again. And then you tried it again. And of course, because there is this relationship between love and contribution. By the way, it's not a perfect linear relationship, is it? Because sometimes you love to do something and you're not very, you don't contribute very much. You're not very good at it. That's called a hobby and that's okay. Some things you love to do that you'll never get paid to do and that's okay because a life with more love in it is a better life. So yeah, okay, cool. But you, you turned it into contribution to the point where more and more and more probably writers and authors and other folks are turning to you and going, can we do this together? Well, Adi, who's your book, he, he can't read your mind. You had to, you know, like you had to take yourself seriously. Now, of course, you trust him. So trust and love are like this, aren't they? Because you're going to experiment. You're going to try something out. And maybe, I don't know, I don't know you this that well in terms of all other parts of your job, but maybe there was a couple of other things you loved that, that it didn't play out. And then you're like, oh, I actually don't love that very much at all. So there is some real trust context that has to exist. But you're a you know, living, breathing example of flipping, making the job up to fit your loves. It didn't just happen, did it? This did not know. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, and there are so many um, that I could have gotten to. But um, Alicia's question really hit home for me, because um, I'm also a manager. Um, and she says, I'm so excited to be talking about this. But it also sounds very exhausting as a manager or a teacher, um, and even as a parent. So she's a parent of multiple kids. How do we do this? Or maybe even, I know that's a, that's a big question, but how do we get started? Yes, well, one of the reasons, I'm sorry, what was the name of the person who asked that question again? Alicia. Alicia. Uh, Alicia. So Alicia, frankly, one of the reasons why we put together the learning series is because the moment you start thinking about this, it, it's like, whoa. And then it, it almost immediately your brain hits parent, uh, team, uh, me, uh, kids, right? It, it hits everything. And part of the challenge why companies build such boring, loveless jobs is because we haven't really put it into parenting, kids, schools, lessons. So this is an ecosystem, which is why we put the learning series together. So the short answer to your question, Alicia, is, you know, pre-order the book and come to the sessions because we're going to dive into that so that you're not overwhelmed. Um, the best place to start, though, always is you. I know you're a team leader, but you can't really pay attention to your people unless you paid attention to yourself. So it's that old, put your own oxygen mask on first. Otherwise it's all theoretical. You have some activities every single day. Your day is like a buffet. It's showing you so many different things every day. Some of them are red threads, they are. And some of the clues are what we talked about in terms of volunteering or rapid learning, whatever. Some of them are red threads. Just start next week. Be intentional every day to think about what red threads can I weave today? Just start with you, start with you. And then once you've got some specificity to you, you can start turning your lens onto your team because it isn't exhausting. You're really saying to your team, uh, and there's a very simple ritual through which you can do this called a check-in, where you're saying to your team 15 minutes every week, just, just two questions about last week and two questions about the upcoming week. Last week, you're just going, what do you love? What do you loathe? This week, what are your priorities? How can I help? That's a check-in. What do you love? What do you loathe? What are your priorities? How can I help? And if you do that in the context of a love and work team, what you'll do is you'll, you'll start to get such vivid detail that you had no idea about in terms of who that person is and what they want to contribute. Now, remember, you don't have to, Adi doesn't have to change your job, Julie, so that it, you know, do what you love. No, he doesn't have to do that. 
Does he have to shut you down so that he says to you, you can't do any of that ever? Well, he can. But I tell you what, that's very exhausting for him because now, ignorant of your loves or knowing them and then crushing them, he's got to try to push the noodle of Julie up a hill. Okay, you want to talk about exhausting? It's trying to make people's loves be repressed. And that's the last thing I think I'd say on this is that loves are weird. Loves are amazing. Red threads are amazing when you've got a few of them in your day. But loves are energy and it's got to flow. So love's unexpressed. Some of you felt this, where you've been in a job where there was something that you love, not everything, but something, and you didn't get a chance to express it. It burns you up from the inside out. It will destroy you. You think about your kids. The only thing with you, you're doing with your kids, pay attention. Most of the time with our kids in schools, we spend so much time, Julie and I are both parents, we know this, you spend so much time trying to make sure that they get their work done. They meet that GPA requirement. And your entire life isn't you paying attention to your kids. It's you pushing against your kids. Do you talk about tiring? Exhausting? <laughs> That's exhausting. And the person it's most exhausting for is the kid. It's like, oh. So this is an entirely different, um, I, I would say, love-focused approach to all the things you mentioned, Alicia but it doesn't make life more complicated. It goes with the flow. And so it makes life for you and for the people that you lead and love. It makes love much, I mean, life much more human, much more fluid and better. Well, Marcus, I want to thank you so much. And I want to thank the audience for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to the next five sessions. Um, for more information, everyone, check out loveandwork.org. And there were lots of um, questions in the chat about where to pre-order. Um, if you go to loveandwork.org, uh, you can find out more information there. Julie, thank you so much for sharing your loves with us. It, uh, for me, certainly, it's just always a joy to to be on the receiving end of your contribution. And uh, I so wish we could be in the same room. And I know that in the next couple of months, uh, we will be at HBS and uh, we will be, uh, we'll be able to be in the same room together. So I'm yes. so, looking, so looking forward to that. Thank you everybody for coming. There's so much lovely work to do actually. And I hope that even, even today, it can start your thinking about a more loving way of living and working. And if you really do wanna make change, please do come to this learning series, pre-order the book, and then we'll dive into each of these streams because it does all sort of fit together. We don't have this separated life. We've got this one life, one cup that is either filled or empty of love. And when it's empty, we're terrible. But when it's filled, ah, we're magnificent. So thank you, Julie, and thank you everyone else for coming.